Very well. All right. And with that said, let's get right into it. All right. Marlo, you have anything you want to say to the viewers watching? Uh, no, just thank you for having me on the show today. I'm excited. Ah, awesome. perfect. All right. So, first thing we want to talk about, you know, early life. Growing mm -hmm. up. Tell us a little bit about, you know, Marlo as a kid. Give us some insight into your life. Um, I was always around the soccer ball, always laughing, always smiling. Um, from I was four, I started playing. My dad put me in the sport, and um, I grew up in the I grew up in the states. But my mom and grandma, uh, that side of the family is Jamaican. That's how I'm connected and able to play for the national team. Um, so my grandma actually spent a lot of time with me growing up and raising me and, and that stuff. My parents were around as well. But yeah, just very happy, good, lucky kid. Um, Always smiling, always kicking, running around. Um, which part? Which part of America um, were you born and raised in? Uh, Northern Virginia. Oh, Virginia. Right. Yeah. All right. So you said that your mother was Jamaican. Was there a deliberate effort from any of your parents to like put you around football? Yes, my dad. He threw okay. me right into it. There we go. And tell us about him and his connection to the sport. Did he play, or is he just um, the normal American fan of, of um, football? He's a fan, but he. Uh, played growing up. He lived a bit in England. His family was in the military. Mm -hmm. So um, he played a little bit, I believe, like when he was in the military as well. But he definitely was around sports his whole life. All right. So you came from a military father. Yeah. How was it growing up? Um, with um, What branch was he in? Uh, he was in the Navy and as well as Army. Oh, yeah. So how was it growing up with uh, growing up with uh, a military parent? Uh, it was definitely strict at moments, um, but I believe that's the reason I'm able to be successful and a professional player. Um, just the way he, he raised me and just the minor details in life to focus on those things and, and just um, having like a certain attitude towards sports. Um, All right. And seeing that he was in the military, that doesn't mean he was gone a lot of time. Do you think... I points in, in time football would have been a way for you to stay close to him while he was away or keep your mind off the fact that he was gone? Yeah, he was. it's a very good point. He was deployed twice, um, once to the Emirates when I was younger, mm -hmm. and then again, I believe, to Iran or Iraq, one of them. Mm -hmm. But um, it was definitely a, get, a getaway for me when he was gone. Um, and thankfully for my mom, there's four of us, four children. So my mom was alone at those moments and she would drive us all the, the different events we had to do and stuff like that. But definitely, I think football played a huge role. All right, Marla. So we are connected through our Jamaican, our Jamaican mm -hmm. place, let's see. Mm -hmm. Right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Tell me about, um, you know, the influence in your home because your father was away a lot, but your mom mm -hmm. is Jamaican. That means that you are your mom. I'm not sure if she's from Jamaica or your grandma yeah. from Jamaica. But tell us about um, heavy Jamaican presence in your household. Uh, yeah, it was very heavy because my mom grew up and lived till she was about 20 in Jamaica and then came over to the States. She was in Kingston. So, I mean, you know, just even like the food in the house, it was always like Jamaican food. And when she would get mad at us, you know, the pot would come out and all that stuff. So, and I was, I'm probably the closest to my mom out of the mm -hmm. four children, I think, because... I spent a lot of time with her while my dad was away and just even now like we're always speaking so I think I was able to pick up the culture a lot through her um and then I spent a lot of time with my grandma as well so I was able to kind of get that culture in ask about the siblings like speak to us about your siblings where did you fall in the four? First, second, third, last the baby oh you're the youngest oh. yeah. <laughs> so, so that, mean, that means you are probably the furthest removed from Jamaica, or are you, would you say you're the closest to the Jamaican country? Mm, I definitely think I'm the closest. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and sports? Did, did your brothers and sisters play sports? Yeah, both of my brothers played basketball growing up. Not, I think no one else played soccer. My sister did, but she only played for like one season. She actually became a cheerleader and a dancer and was one of the cheerleaders for like the college basketball team so she's into sports but totally different type of sport um i was really the only one into football all right something that stood out to me a while ago everybody know that the, the jamaican grandmothers are a heavy part of the family yeah you know and depending <laughs> on, on your family structure there's a dynamic there between the 
with the youngest kid and the grandmother. Tell mm -hmm. us about really the discipline or the favoritism, something that, that's there. Give us an insight into that. Definitely, I was favorite, like hands down. <laughs> um, couldn't really do wrong, always a favorite. Always when we would go to her house and leave, she would like, you know, let the other kids get out the door, pull me aside, give me some extra food or some money, you know what I mean? Um, so that was always funny with her growing up. That sounds like a Jamaican grandmother. Who yeah. was a disciplinarian? Um, I think my dad and my sister also was very, um, I don't know, she was very strict with the other siblings as well, always keeping us in line. Yeah. All right. So, so your footballing career now, so you said um, your, your father basically put the ball at your feet now. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you'd have played like organized football? What's the youngest age you'd have played football and organized mm -hmm. Organized, I'd say six or seven. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Um, actually, my dad was my coach growing up in those mm -hmm. those ages. I started when I was, let's say, four. Yeah. Um, between four to six, it's, it's just kind of that kick around with the small net. Mm -hmm. But my dad was my coach, I think, until I was about, let's say, 10 or 12. Um, and mm -hmm. then, obviously, like the military got in the way. Um, and we got, I was going into more of a level where I needed a, not that my dad's not a real coach, but a real coach, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So but he cool. never, he never left my side as far as like the coaching. He's actually flying out here to Budapest tomorrow with my mom to watch the cup final. Nice. Um, so was, this like, was this at the club level when you started out or was it um, in what was it, elementary school? Yeah. Which, which? Yeah. Elementary school. Oh, you start already playing for your school. All right, a question now. Um, did you always know, or did your parents always know that you would be a professional footballer? Were you always the standout in your group? Or, or yeah. were, you, what, were you a late bloomer? Uh, no, I I was always kind of a standout. I say that in like a humble way, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I saw that you played at the collegiate level. Talk to me about that. Um, no, but even before then, I want to talk to her about her her um, progress towards college. Let's because do it. Let's do it. not everybody plays Division One soccer. Like that's you know that's rare here. So mm -hmm. talk to us about your, your junior year, your senior year, and what was it like playing in high school leading up to your soccer soccer um, in university? Yeah, so I played um, in one of the best clubs in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, from in the high school and as well as for my high school varsity team from my freshman year so that was always a bit difficult because i would run from training to training i would go from high school training from like three to let's say 4 30 have a little break and then have my club training from five to eight or whatever that time would have been uh, so i think that extra training really helped me in a way of preparing me as far as the load going into college but I would say I was always in one of the top clubs um, growing up and definitely always had in my mind what I wanted to achieve as far as um, playing D1 and professionally after. So in high school, in high school, you knew that you were um, striving towards becoming a professional footballer. Yeah, I, I think I knew from like seventh, eighth grade that that's exactly what I wanted to do. What was the recruitment like yeah, was um, to college? Uh, All right. Did you only have one option? Tell, tell, tell her what your <laughs> offer is. How, how, was, how was your Gmail looking at the end of the year, <laughs> beginning of senior year? We're curious. Yeah, that was a fun time, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. And back when I went to college, they actually like sent the letters in the mail. Oh. Um, I'm dating. Uh, I think you just made yourself, right? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> we, we were like, um, tell us about how your Gmail is looking. Yeah. So, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, tell us about um, how did you feel getting emails and like how many... Um, how many offers did you get? Um, I got loads of offers. Um, in the beginning, when I was just getting into high school, I would get like the smaller D3 schools. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was so excited, but my dad and my mom were like, in a, in a nice way, they're like, I'd like kind of push those aside because we know some better ones are coming. Yeah. Um, so for me, like the first one I got, I remember it was like a D3 school. I was just so stoked for it. And then towards my junior year, the real ones started coming. The top D1 schools like Maryland, uh, Georgetown, Boston College, Boston University. And that's when I really started to get like, wow, okay, this is actually going to happen. It's up to me to actually pick a, t like pick, a, pick a school instead of wondering if a school would pick me. Yeah. 
but I always told myself I wanted to play at the best school possible. Mm -hmm. So if I look back at how I went about picking a team, I just picked the best football, like football school, which was Florida State, um, where actually Jody goes now. Yeah. Um, but after my freshman year, I realized that it's more than football. It's about how I'm going to feel in a, a community, how I'm doing on the academic side. And I decided it was best to maybe leave and, and try elsewhere. So I transferred to University of Oregon, which for me was a much better decision, which they are also very still in the top in D1 and just an overall great athletic school. But it wasn't um, the number one school for football. Yeah, and that's a, that's a far journey. That's like... Um across the country like one day <laughs> I'm flying from the southeast to the northwest um what was it like traveling from virginia then down to florida then all the way to the west coast to oregon like how, how, what was that like uh that was difficult i think at that moment when i was on the plane and going over there i knew i was going to be kind of a world traveler at that point mm -hmm. that um this is where really it's going to start my career is abroad and 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 other parts of the world and things like that. But it was definitely a journey. Um, I think it was like five, six hour flight. Yeah. And it was totally different. Like the, the West Coast is completely different than the East Coast where I grew up. I won't say which one I like more, but it was definitely <laughs> different and different people. So do you think do you think your time that far away from home, like absolutely remote? Like you were completely isolated from your home. Like I bet when you were going to school in Florida, you'd have been closer, you'd have been much closer to home than than, than going to school all the way. Like, do, do you think that prepared you for for football in Europe? Do you think that was the beginning stages in your preparation? Yeah, definitely. Because when I went to Florida, my as my as I said, my dad's in the military, so he was able to transfer down to Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, so they were still around. And then when I went to Oregon, he was like, yeah, I'm not transferring out to West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that was really my first step, kind of alone. And I think just that freedom and just being able to see a complete different side of the world really opened my eyes to wanting to play abroad in Europe. Um, because I had the opportunity a few times to come back and do some trials in the U.S., but I, I just really, I really love living abroad in Europe. I really love the lifestyle and, and that. So it, it definitely did open my eyes. Uh, one question: were, were you a were you a party girl in college, or were you focused on the books and read my mind? The books <laughs> and the football, the college experience. We went to college. We went to university in Jamaica, mm -hmm. so we didn't get that <laughs> America college experience. Tell us about that. My freshman year at Florida State, I was a party girl. Okay. I was out and about. I was loving life. <laughs> and then when I transferred, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna be serious about this this football. I have to pick one or the other. I'm gonna live like a normal person, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a footballer. Yeah. And I had to make that decision. It was tough at first, but it definitely changed my whole career because I could not be as successful as I am if I still had that freshman lifestyle. For sure. Yeah. All right. So we're done with college now. We're going to talk about the transition that you made final year to your first professional contract. Walk us through that. Um, tell us again about the options and then tell us about the transition. How, how did you take it? Um, yeah, so I had, so you mean from college to professional? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I remember I had just finished my season and I, I buckled down and did really well. I was able to graduate early um, and I knew I wanted to graduate early and head over to Europe to play. I didn't get drafted um in the states so my coach hooked me up with the agent and then there was a lot of interest from sweden so um it was my first obviously the first interest and kind of the first contract thrown at me and it was division three sweden and i wasn't very satisfied but i was told just go and kind of test out the waters and see how it is it doesn't have to be a top club right now um so i just went and I actually really enjoyed it. Um, the level was, I would say, a few steps behind what I was playing in college so that I wasn't satisfied with. But I think it was a good kind of just first get your toes dipped in the water and see what it's all like to be over in Europe. Um, from I had, a, I think, a six-month contract there in Sweden, but I ended up early 
took myself on trial to the Netherlands and actually made the professional team there. And then from there, my career really took off, I would say. And question, in your, in your, first, in your first few months or, or years after university, right? This is when um, kids leave, leave the nest, the proverbial nest, and head out into the world and fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. The opportunity that you were given, did that make, um, were you comfortable or were you able to fend for yourself with the limited opportunities that you were getting in a Division Three Swedish club? Or did you fight, or did you struggle, I'd say, financially or as it relates to your own independence because it wasn't as big a club? And football is the job after all. Um, it definitely was not financially okay. Like I, there were some moments where I was wondering, okay, like it, it's this, like is this it, like type thing. But I have to say, playing in and especially in the women's game, playing and growing up without being paid for it, I was actually, I actually forgot when I become professional, I'm going to get paid. So that was like extra bonus. Yeah. So I was like, oh, so you mean I get to continue in Europe and I get paid? Like for me, that blew my mind. So I was just, I was honestly just thankful and still I'm grateful to the fact that I get paid to do this every day. Um, to me, it sounded like you didn't enjoy your time in Sweden. Tell us, I want to know a little bit about that. Why, other than the football side of things, mm -hmm. um, and it not being as professional as you wanted it to be, tell us, why didn't you enjoy your time in Sweden? Well, I enjoyed it because I, I, I met a lot of new people and I learned different cultures and stuff. But I think for me, I was so focused on this is what I see in, in social media. This is what I see in the world as what a professional footballer should be doing. It should be living. And this is not it. So I think I couldn't allow myself to enjoy um, being abroad at that moment. Now you can throw me in any environment and I can, I think I've matured enough as a person that I can find things to make myself enjoy the situation. Um, but I was very young then. So I think it was just a bit difficult to enjoy the moment. And it was a very small town. Right. Um, forgive us, we're not going to try to pronounce any of these teams that you played for. So <laughs> you can play that, Jawad. Tell us about the next step you took in, in the Netherlands. You played in the, the first division there. Yeah, so I played at Zwolle. Um, and that was a great club. Very professional. Everything. All right, people. More or less having some technical difficulties, but we're still here. Um, I, I like, the, I like the, the, where the conversation is going so far, bro. She gives us a lot of insight. That what, what is really standing out to me is how hard it is as a footballer to transition from school to professional. You know, her first contract, and she was a standout in America. Mm -hmm. She didn't get drafted, being a standout all her life, yeah. and then she had to go to Europe and fend for herself. Bro. That must have been hard. So, what, what, what is what stood out to you so far in the conversation? Um, you know, uh, her ties to Jamaica, first of all, it's obvious that it's obvious that they were strong, you mm -hmm. know, and we talk about her grandma who was born and raised in Jamaica and her mother as well. Yeah. You can see it it tells her relate well to everybody. Yeah. And this is the type of integration that we see in women's team. It appears that women are closer knit than the men because probably of the involvement of the Jamaican side of the heritage when growing up. Because we see Shade and, and the Swabie sisters, like we know that they are very, very closely related to their Jamaican heritage. Yeah. And it shows, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and also she she mentioned about the presence, the Jamaican presence in her also, talking about that one grandma that's going to squeeze your thing when everybody gone, you know, and, and the favoritism there. So I really enjoyed the conversation. People were going to be talking lots more. When she returns, we're going to be talking about um, a national team. You know, she was on that team when Jamaica qualified for the World Cup. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, big competition coming up in the summer. We're going to be talking about that. You know, we're going to get into her personal life a little bit more. You know, ask her some questions that I'm sure you guys will enjoy. So stay tuned. Yeah, man. Because today apparently it was stormy for her today. Yeah, and so that, that affected her internet connection. So I'm thinking that's probably what happened in front of the trip total came through. Yeah. But, Over there. Yeah, we're trying to get more of the line. People, people talk to me. Yeah, people who are watching. Tell us any questions you might have to ask. 
um, type in the, in the comment section when she gets back when she starts out her starts out her internet. Tell us one who don't want to ask Marlo because yeah. at the end at this at the end of the video we're going to have a segment where we just ask her some rapid fire questions. So people, first of all, like the stream. First of all, there are sixteen of us here. How many people? How many likes? How many likes? Let me see. Twenty-one likes. Okay, yeah, that's, so not that's, not, that's not bad. You know, I, I like the support. So people. Put in the in the comment section um the questions that you guys might like us to ask Marla and we'll try our best to get back Marla. All right, it seems so. like she feels she's having some kind of thing. Kush said, Hey Marla, say so yeah, look, Marla. Yeah, Ames, more fire, bro. Um, Rose Gold said the best. I don't know if you're saying that Marla is the best, or this or that sports TV is the best. best, but you'll be accurate. They don't have yeah. to do each other exclusive, bro. There we go. <laughs> Um, can't work, can't they, huh? But people, come in the questions, man. What, what, what do you want to see, um, Marla answer? Tell us the questions. What you, what would you ask her if you were on the stream right now? Talk uh, to us about that. Also, bro, we just hit one thousand seven hundred subscribers. Yeah. So let's get us to one thousand eight hundred. There you go. Let's get us to two thousand. So people, if you're on right now and not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. Loving it, loving it, loving it. All right. Also, let let's show to some of the content that we have going on. Um, so last night we did a live, you know, probably up there for one of the best lives so far for the year. Um, we spoke to some of you guys, some of the viewers, we spoke to Cataract, we spoke to Craig Butler. Mm -hmm. You know, we spoke about the quota system that is being proposed that are implemented in the JFF in regards to our national teams. You know, we also spoke about uh, professional players coming and trials for our under 20 team. But that didn't take the night. That was not the news that took the night. That news I'm speaking of is that England, you know, apparently showed interest in recruiting Leon Bailey for the national mm -hmm. team. And Craig sent in his receipts. Craig showed us in the, the email from the technical director at the time, and we put it up on the screen and we read it. And yeah. it is true. It is true. They, 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 they start to, to, to get the information of his grandparents. Yeah. Wow. So it, it's all incredible stuff, you know. Um, People trying to get what Mario it seems as though, as I said, connectivity issues. Yeah, man. So, people that are, that are just joining the stream, we're talking to Marlo Sweatman. This is like getting to know. This is like getting to know feature episode two. And we're talking to Marla Sweatman, our reggae girl. So, she, she will be back. She will be back. So, mm -hmm. stay tuned. Don't talk to them, bro. Yeah, so, so people. There are 12 people here, and I don't see anybody that type or questions and want to ask Marla. Come on, man, people. Come on, man. Interact with me. Remember, this is not just mine, and this is not just Rush's. This is all of our business people. Let us know what's on your mind. Tell us what you're thinking. Tell us what you're thinking. We have 12 people here for the people who just are joined. Like up the stream. All right, so. We have back the woman of the of the moment, you know. We have the woman of the hour. She's back with us, um, Marlo. So it's Marlo. Um, um, what happened just now? Well, there's a big storm going on here, and so mm -hmm. the light, the power keeps going out. When the power goes out, the internet goes off, and then there goes my wife. Well, I'm thank, sorry. Thank, thank God for a quick reboot. We're back again. Okay. And we're in Netherlands. Yeah. That's where we were. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Zwolle. Um, mm -hmm. That was the overall, like, that was really where I felt, okay, this is the professional lifestyle. This is where I, I see myself. And this is this is exactly what I imagine for a professional to be in an environment like this. Unfortunately, I was doing great the first six months. And then I picked up a, a knee injury. I believe it was a, I didn't. In Europe, they're a bit different with the doctors. They don't send you right away. Um, what I believe yeah. was I tore my meniscus, and they just told me to rest. Mm -hmm. In that time, uh, a girl was able to take my spot, and I wasn't re-signed after that. Um, mm -hmm. so that was my Netherlands journey. But I really I love the Netherlands, and I love that league. And my dream would be to go back sometime and play for Ajax. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a big aspiration. There we go. Um, talk to us about because you said this was like really your first taste of professional football. Talk to us about being a professional footballer, not personally, but as it relates to a footballer. Talk to us about the regime. 
that 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 one would undergo playing in a professional sense. Yeah. So I'll just kind of run you through my day, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I mean, just me personally, I have a morning routine. This I worked on with the mental performance coach. So that would just be as far as you know, having a good breakfast, waking up on time, journaling, kind of what I would find is it what would give me what I could do today to be successful. So I would journal that out, what I'm grateful for, just quickly, 10 minutes journaling, um, and then go about what I would do with the team. And that would be kind of arriving an hour before the training. Mm -hmm. We train for about two hours a day. We have lunch together um, in the facilities. And then we go for recovery, whether that be um, Norma Tech, massage, TENS machine, Creo sauna. Um, so we let's say we meet about nine and then I'm home around two, three every day after that kind of my free time. Normally I'll go to a cafe and just kind of be out and about. Um, so, and then come home, have dinner and do it all again the next day. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good life to me. You know? yeah. you're, doing, you're doing what you love um, exactly. as a profession. That seems very good. So after after you were displaced, unfortunately, due to an untimely injury, how old were you in your journey by now? I think I was 23. 23. Yeah. And then you made the next step to Hungary, where you are now, but you played at different clubs? Again, you yeah. won't attempt to pronounce these clubs. <laughs> <laughs> so the first club where I stayed in Hungary and was there for about two and a half years is Seged, same I Seged. Mm -hmm. Um... I got there because I we had qualified for the World Cup, and I needed a club, just any club. Um, and it was either wait for the perfect club to come or accept what came to me and just be playing, getting minutes in that. So that's why I accepted the offer to play, even though, um, again, it didn't meet my professional standards. Yeah. I ended up loving it. Um, I love the culture in Hungary. The coach was great. The team was great. And I ended up staying two and a half years. Partially that was due to we had a break in COVID. And I have to actually recognize the club for this because a lot of clubs didn't do it. But they continued to pay me and give me housing, even though we weren't um, playing in that COVID. About, let's say, six, seven months period of, of no play, nothing, no mm -hmm. league. And I think that was around the world. So I'm very thankful that my club continued to support me financially during that time. Um, and then that's when I, after two and a half years, I decided it's enough. And I came here where I am now to Sambate. And this is the best place I've been so far in my professional career, as far as facilities, um, the people I'm surrounded by, staff, everything. It's just top notch. Right. Um, um, somebody in, in the comment section is asking, is there Jamaican food in Hungary? Uh, <laughs> no, there's not really. There's one, there's a few places in Budapest you can go to buy like hot sauce and and maybe jerk sauce and stuff, but there's not really a shop or a, a restaurant. So maybe Tiffany and I have to change that. Yeah, I, I know. Open up. Talking about Tiffany, I was just I was just asking, um, how how is it having another Jamaican in the league? Like, and what what is it? What do you and Tiffany do? Like, do you guys meet up? Like, do you guys have a relationship? Seeing that you both are in Hungary. Yeah, we were not, we knew each other before she came here. So mm -hmm. I was here and then she came a year after. We knew each other, but we weren't like, I wouldn't say we'd pick up the phone and call each other. Like we were just kind of, we knew each other. But now we're we're so close and it's been great to have her in the league. I mean, even though we're on rival teams, we can still yeah. help and motivate each other. And whenever we need advice, we're there for each other. Um, playing abroad is difficult especially to play in Eastern Europe. Um, I'll put it that way. So we've yeah. definitely been able to be there for each other throughout everything. And just also like celebrate with one another. Um, like we're both going to a cup final and we're able to, we're able to battle hard against each other on Wednesday, but also be there for each other to congratulate each other. So I think that's nice. And then of course, traveling to camp uh, when we have camp is always fun. Yeah. And and you were friends in Eastern Europe. I reckon that has something to do with the curls in your hair. Makes yeah. it a bit harder than, than normal. Yeah, we definitely stand out. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, from everything. I am 
uh, from color to style to the way we talk to even our personalities. Very people here, and it's neither one is right or wrong. People here are very quiet, and I think we are more outgoing. Um, yeah. From what we know of Tiffany Cameron, she's definitely not the, not the quiet type. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's oh she's so fun it's always like amazing to hang out with her um so it's been cool to actually to talk about that together to like okay how do we continue to keep our personality and be who we are but also I respect where we are um and and kind of adapt to their culture as well so it's been cool all right so speaking about one of your national team partners let's transition to international football and the first question I have before I even go into you play at under 20 level and the national team. I don't have seen the um, team. But the first thing I want to ask, was there any aspirations to play for the US, US. the US? US national team? Yeah, um, there was. I got called into the U18 camp. Mm -hmm. But as I always said, um, I'd rather be a part of a team that will make history than and be an important person and and change lives of the youth and all that stuff than just be another person in let's say a, a pool of the u.s squad yeah um so for me i like to be in environments where i know i'm gonna make an impact a positive impact so yeah there's some ambition but i i I made the right choice to play for. Yeah. To we, we think you made the right choice to yeah, Definitely the right choice. <laughs> you level? Yeah, tell us about uh, Marla Sweatman at the under 20 level for Jamaica. What was that like? That was really fun. Um, I I remember the first time I got the first time I got dropped off at camp. Um, I was really nervous because it was totally totally new. everything was new to me. But the girls welcomed me with open arms. Um, and we used to stay at the, the old reggae boys house. So before all the the hotels and, and that the fancy stuff, we stayed back there. And it was really cool. Just there weren't many foreigners. I think the first time around it was me and maybe Tori Patterson and a few others. So it was really cool to kind of be thrown into the culture um, and how they accepted us with open arms. So tell us tell us some of the names that would have been in camp with you uh, playing under twenty. Uh, Shanika Williams was there, the old maestro we used to call her. Um, Trudy Carter, Bunny, they were all there. Kanya, Didai, um, Tonto, who else? Um, Renee. But it, but it was really Shanika Williams, Trudy, me, and, and Bunny that were kind of in that, that middle. All right. All right, so from what you're saying, I can tell that you were there before um, the influence of Cinella Marley came around the team, right? Mm-hmm. Right, so I want to know the difference, you know, prior to her um, involvement and after. Tell us what happened when she came in because we can tell that she had a really, really big influence on the team and we're doing well um, since her involvement. Yeah, her influence has been amazing. Um, I think for sure we wouldn't be where we are without her. Um, but at the same time, the professionalism of the girls and her merging together has brought us to where we are. And before, yeah, like I said, we stayed at the, the reggae boys house and there was a lot of struggle. I mean, struggle for even just to get water at the trainings um, and all that stuff. And now we're, you know, we're treated, I would say, properly or to the ability that like we can be with staying at nice places, accommodation, top food, um, even the gear is much better. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been cool. Honestly, it's been amazing to be from the beginning and see how it's grown. Um, and I think what's important is to always keep that in mind where where it was before um, and kind of have that like gratefulness of where it's going. Yeah. And it still, it still has, has a long way to go. Right? Tell us about your mm -hmm. first cap at the youth level. Tell us about your first time stepping onto the pitch with those girls and hearing the anthem play. What was going through your brain in that moment? Uh, it was a very emotional moment. I remember it. Um, I do think I had a tear coming out mm -hmm. just because in the moment I'm just thinking like, okay, like this is bigger than me. This is me representing my mom's country. This is me finding a part of who I am as far as the Jamaican side and just also touching the goals that I've always set out for myself. 
Um, but to be honest, I get emotional every time I hear the anthem, even now. Um, it's 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 an honor, really. All right, so you stepped up from the from the, the youth level. All right. So we're going to be talking about the World Cup. But before we get there, it was it was an eventful qualifying campaign. And we qualified, you know, let's say by the skin of our teeth, if mm -hmm. I could both, you know, show my Jamaican side right now. <laughs> tell us about qualifying. How hard was that? Or tell us about the journey. So before you answer that, Marlo, one question I have to ask before you answer that. Getting the call up to the senior program, like tell us how you felt in that moment first. And then I think we'll knew that she would have been in the senior team, but <laughs> well, go, for it, go for it. Um, I'm just the type of person like I know, but I'm always thankful and grateful when it happens. So I know mm -hmm. it's gonna happen, but at the same time, like I'm, I respond like, "Wow, like it happened" type thing. Um, so when I find when I got the call, I was just ecstatic. Um. Super, super happy, and my whole family was happy. So, but as far as going into the World Cup, that journey was so up and down. I mean, geez, I'm there was it was way more than football, is how I'll put it. Um, it was about the things with the JFF, the finances. It was, are we going to have camp? Are we not going to have camp? Last minute cancellations. Who's playing? Who are the new faces? Who's even going to go to the World Cup? Um, so I have to say there were moments where my joy was taken away mm -hmm. um, just because of all the outside things that were going on. Um, so I, I make it a point now in this journey, no matter what happens, no matter the outside stuff, just to enjoy the moment, um, really take it in and, and really just, yeah, just enjoy it. And um, through all those challenges, what caused the team to prevail? Because we did make it to the World Cup after all. Yeah, I think we all just had the same goal and we knew we weren't going to let anything stop us. And every single person from from the captain to the to the last person who would get subbed onto the field believed in that goal. And really, that's the only way we can continue to go is if every single person believes in it. Um, because there's nothing that can stop us except like your own mind. So we really need to, I think, really just being one team and having the same goal and belief is what got us there. All right. And the moment... The moment when you guys secured qualification, talk uh -huh. talk to the moment because the whole Jamaica felt it, it reverberated to the whole nation. So mm -hmm. talk about the moment. So that's the moment that I that will always be in my head. Um, I got subbed off. I think the seventieth minute of that last match. So mm -hmm. I watched the penalties from the sideline. Uh, I remember I was standing next to Lauren Silver and, and Chidi Lasher. And the moment Dom hit that PK and it went in, like, it just went blank. Like, I couldn't believe it. I, it just didn't register that we we're actually made history and we're going to the World Cup. And my dream I've ever, I ever had of being a kid is actually here. Um, but, yeah, I think. And also just after the match, being in that locker room and, you know, singing the anthem and throwing in that Jamaica boom. Like, I think it, it was just, yeah, the dream come true. Tell, tell us about the celebrations. You touched on it a little bit, but what were the celebrations like afterwards? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Um we're always we're always dancing in the locker room before matches, after matches. So of course after this match we danced. And then you know when we we played the anthem, we had a little remix to it, and then we went back to the hotel and we were all just always together as a team celebrating. Um but it was an amazing moment. And then all we had that one, um, you know, event where we all came to Jamaica and we did a little trip. We had the, the bus set up for us and we went around and got some keys to the cities. And, and that was amazing to just kind of go around the country and, and you know, mix with the people and kind of show our, our gratitude to them for our, their support and just showing our faces. So that was a great trip. Right. Um, let's go. Let's go to the the, the the moment, the World Cup. No, but even before the World Cup, the build up because we secured qualification. Mm -hmm. What happened between Cup, yeah. qualification and the World Cup? Because there, I bet that in of itself must be a journey because you would have to still go back and work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like what was going through your mind all through the time, the preparation after we secured qualification. Talk to us about what happened between because we, the people, wouldn't have 
been privy to such information, but I bet there would be a lot going on that we probably wouldn't know about. So what can you reveal to us? Yeah, there is a lot going on as far as the team, the JFF, the coaching staff. Um, yeah, as always, finances. Um, at the end of the day, we made it to the World Cup, so I can only say that it, it was all worth it and it all worked out. Um, but for me, my personal journey was a bit difficult because this was before, you know, we all signed these big contracts yeah. to, to the top club. So I was worried that maybe the environment I in wasn't good enough. And how am I going to, like, what shape am I going to show up into these camps? How am I going to show up against Australia who their players are playing in the top clubs in the world? Um, so it was very stressful. It was torn between we made it and also okay like i'm stressed like how am i preparing myself mm -hmm. um but at the end of the day it all worked out and you know we had the camp in south africa we had the florida camp we went over to england a little bit and did that little tour um so i think those camps really helped us in that moment to kind of get away from our professional environment and check back in okay we're on the right track and then we could go back to the professional environment all right, so the World Cup. Yeah, it's not just about the World Cup. We had three group games. You played in two. So yep. tell us, first of all, tell us about your first game in the World Cup. Yeah, we played against Brazil. Um, that was that was interesting because, you know, we're going against the best players in the world. So it's, it's like how do you even mentally approach that game? And yeah. I think do you approach it of like, oh, my God, I'm playing against the best players or – or any of this stuff. And and really my mindset, and I'm sure a lot of the other girls, as they're all very professional, is just it's another game. We prepare the same way you prepare for any other game. Um and I think if you go with that mindset into every game, then when you do get to the big stages like the World Cup, it just comes naturally. So I have to be honest that uh, I would say that my preparation did help me go into that game. But at the same time, it was amazing to play the best players in the world and, and be in that environment and i think it was like eight million people watched from home mm -hmm. um in brazil but uh, we lost but you know we go on from it yeah and, um i think yes we're ambitious but we have to be realistic at the end of the day and making it to the world cup was an achievement in, in and of itself Keep in exactly. mind, right? the same confederation as the usa mexico costa rica mm -hmm. Guatemala, Haiti, so on and so forth there we go it's not an easy confederation to succeed in yeah uh, we made that step so it is a huge accomplishment. It's, it, no, it's up to us. And I wanted to shed some light on this. We made it last time. Mm -hmm. So the next World Cup, it's not just about making it. We need to take another step to say compete in the group. Then say the mm -hmm. next time we want to make it out of the group. Then say the next time we want to go to the semifinals. So what are the talks in the camp? What's the feel for, the, for this um, World Cup coming up? Um, I have to say I'm really impressed with everyone. with the, the They call it the group of death or whatever we were drawn with. We all have positive attitudes, and that's what I love about every single girl on this team is no matter what comes to them, they can always step over it with positivity and belief. So I think we have very good spirits going into the, the next CONCACAF round, but I totally agree with you as in we made it last time, and we're not really just going to settle for, yeah, we made it again. Like we really want to make an impact when we get there. We want to take strides. We want to take steps because that's the only way for everything to continue to grow. Um, as far as setting the the standards for the young ones to come through after us and, and that stuff. So I definitely agree with what you said. And you speak about the group of that, just segue us into the... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's yeah. talk about the work of a little bit. We can't make escape this. How was France? <laughs> France is great. Um, yeah, I mean, we went to play Australia the last game. Um, and it was a bit of a sad game, obviously, because... After that, we knew the kind of the journey was over. Everything mm -hmm. that we had, it wasn't just the three games. You know, it went all the way back. Um, and I mean, it even went back to when I was playing the U20s. So that was kind of a sad moment, but also an enjoyable moment to realize, okay, we did this, we did our best, and we look forward to what's to come. But for me, it was always my dream to play in a World Cup. So I think just just achieving that was fantastic and a great well, well was there any sight seeing it in France or it was just strictly football? Um, no, we, I mean, they always have a good time with us and let us kind of see around. Even when we went to the Cayman, 
you know, we um, did the swim with the stingray, so I do like that about the Federation. And when we were in France, we did this little, like, I don't know exactly what it was. They had the wire, and we got in the bubble, and they took us down. Like, I think it was through, I don't know if it was Rhymes or wherever we were. But this was so scary. But anyways, it was nice to kind of see around. Um, but I think once we started the matches, like, it was pretty much just, it was just matches. Yeah. All right, so talk to us about the summer, because the, J- the JFS, has a big summer, not even just the regular girls, like the JFF in and of itself. We have a big summer. It's already started with mm-hmm. our under-17 girls recently kicking off their campaign. We have under-20 competition, so on and so forth, like the Nations League. And yeah. we have the CONCACOF Women's Championship. Talk to us about the big summer from the women's perspective, what we should expect, what's going through your mind. You know, um, Just tell us about your views on the upcoming rigorous competition that we're facing. Yeah, I'm excited. I know all the girls are as well, but as you said, it's going to be a big, uh, big summer and it's not going to be, it's not going to be a walkthrough. I mean, if you look at our, our group, we definitely drew the, the hardest teams apart from, you know, you like Canada, but I think, yeah, it's definitely going to be difficult, but we're excited for it. Um, and I think you can only be a true professional if, the tough games excite you. Um, if you want to back down from it, maybe this level is not for you. So I have to I have to say we're very excited and we're ready to accept the challenge and just give it our all and, you know, make the people of Jamaica proud again. Um, what, what are we trying to do? Um, do we want to win the competition? Or, because it also serves as qualification for the next World Cup. Mm-hmm. So are we focused on getting to the – and we meaning the reggae girls team. Mm-hmm. Are we trying to win this um, championship or just make it to the World Cup? Both would be fine, to be honest. <laughs> what are we trying to do? Yeah, I think we're going to do both. We're going to try and do both. Definitely the overall goal is make it to the World Cup, but before you can even get there, you have to you have to take care of the things before that, and that would just be um, getting the results in the first matches. Um, taking it day by day, taking it game by game, will then allow for the, the, the goals we have in mind to be accomplished. All right, so Marla Swipman in, let's say, 15 to 20 years when it's all over, right? Uh-huh. What, what you've, you've, you've obviously accomplished some of the things. You've been to a World Cup, you play at a professional level, you went to great D1 schools and played well there. What's next? What, what does Marla Swipman want to check off her list before it's all said and done and she hangs up the boots and comes and coaches Jamaica? Just, just, <laughs> just putting that in there. What, what does Marla Swipman want to accomplish? Um, another World Cup, Olympics, want to qualify for the Olympics. On the professional mm-hmm. front, I want to win the cup final, which I have the chance to do on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And I want to play in Champions League. Um, so those are kind of the four things I have. And then, as you said, um, you weren't far off when uh, one goal after football is to be a Jamaican national team coach. So, All right. sure. Yeah. All right. So it's coming down. As you know, Marla is a, is a professional player, so she has a routine, so we don't want to keep her too long. So we're going to segue into the final segment. Um, humor us with these rapid-fire questions. Okay. This is, this is the fun part. We got the business out the way. Yeah. So let's have, let's have some fun with it. So we're going to ask you some questions and let's give us some straightforward answers. You can play the fifth if you want or not. You'd like it to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's go. The first question I have. Who is the best player in the Yankee Girls team right now? Oof. Tough one. You can't say Marla Carter. Carter. Judy Carter. Judy Carter. Judy Carter. Oh, good. That's, that's okay. Fun. And uh, this most skillful player in the team, they can be, they can be the same or they can be mutually exclusive. The most skillful player in the team. Ooh. Jody Brown right now, I think. Jody, yeah. yeah I think I'd, I think I'd go with that one. Too. Yeah, and the, the Joker, who's yeah. the comedian? Yasmin, Yaz, for sure. No question. <laughs> That's not a surprise. Yeah, Yaz looks like the vibes girl in the team. Mm-hmm. All right, tell us about the leader in the team. Who's the leader? Our leaders. Our leaders. Yeah, give us, give us like, say, four people who you'd say distinctively is a leader in the team. You can include yourself in this one if you want. All right. Uh, Bunny. Mm-hmm. Swaby, Allison Swaby. Yeah. Jenny Lou Asher. Um, I would say those three. All right. I know. Good leaders. All right. What is your favorite food? No. 
special. Oh. I was going to say, don't come tell me about a burger or hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you like hockey, you like a national dish. Yeah. Yeah, nice one. Did did you, did did um grandma and mommy? I don't know if it was mommy in your household, but in Jamaica we said mommy. Did grandma and mommy cook actually and salt for sure? You growing up? Yeah, all the time. Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah. All right. Where's your favorite place in the world? Mm, Budapest. Budapest. Uh, I'd take that back. Political Bay. answer. Huh? Montego Bay. I want to. Oh, <laughs> they're both politically correct answers. Yeah. Like, okay, you know, I play here and want to go there. Uh, I'm surprised what? you didn't say Virginia what? or oh. Oregon. Before we move to the next one, tell us one thing that you like about each place. Hmm. I'm a city girl, so I like Budapest because it's a very big city. Um, but get this, they speak Hungarian, and I speak a little bit, but enough that I'm in the city around millions of people, but still alone because I don't really understand it. So that's like perfect for me because I'm introvert and extrovert. So I'm there, but not really there. Um, And it's also just beautiful. And then of course the beach and the water at Montego Bay, the world's best, so. All right, um, favorite footballer, male and female? Okay, Hmm. male, I would say Frankie De Jong. Female, that's a tough one. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I need to maybe come back to that one. <laughs> All right. I want to say so many names on our team, actually, because they're mm-hmm. just very inspiring. You know, I'm not going to say typical Alex Morgan. I'm going to think like. Here's yeah. Martha, you know, who plays for played for Brazil growing up. I really liked her. Um, mm-hmm. From the limited knowledge that I had of women's football, she was a standout. But yeah, I won for her, bro. You can't say Martha. I That's won. Fine. I won for her. Okay. Who is your, who is your favorite reggae boy? Ooh. Oh. That's <laughs> a good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hot now. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe Michael. I don't know. There's so many. Antonio? Michael uh-huh. Antonio? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, let's oh. say him. And do you like, um, do you watch the Premier League? Uh, I haven't been keeping up as much as I should, to be honest, right now. You're on board. All right, all right. So, um, what's your favorite thing about Jamaica? And by the way, when was the first time that you came to Jamaica? Because did you get to come any at all as, as, as a young person growing up? Yeah. Yeah, um, I did a few vacations when I was younger, um, but then the real serious times I came were at the beginning of the U20 camps. Um, I came down a few times prior to get my passport sorted. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, ever since then, it's just been kind of business trips for football. And we we asked this we asked this question in our in our last getting to know, so I, I have to ask it to you. Um, Single, taken, or married? I have to ask. People want to know. People want to know, Marlo. We have to ask. I am single. There we go. People, hit her, hit her DMs. <laughs> Don't hit her DMs. <laughs> and and um, tell us something. Somebody want, wanted you to give us something yeah. in Papua. How is your Papua? Well, go on. Ah, Take it easy. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to allow her. Rush, rush is fine. I'm not going to allow her to get off hook that easy. Come on, man. Because... I know you're okay. in the team. I hear Trudy and Bunny and Jody. Uh-huh. I hear how they speak to you girls, and you guys seem to understand perfectly fine. So <laughs> I do, but I'm so shy. That's what it is. <laughs> All right. And um there's your favorite team. Yeah, your favorite football team. Ajax. Ajax. Yeah. Was this um a thing from youth or is it something you adapted when in Netherlands? Uh definitely something I adapted when I was over there. Uh, the more I studied about the culture and and kind of the background of the club. And then obviously my favorite player, Frankie De Jong. So when I used to watch him, he was playing there. Mm-hmm. Really grew my love for that club. All right. So our men's team, we're trying to qualify. Well, mm-hmm. we failed to qualify for this World Cup. That's, that's coming up. Uh, what do you think we need to do? Because the girls seem to have it, though. We went to the last mm-hmm. one. We, we look like we should be going to the next one. Um, what are what should the, the men's team do um, to improve? That's a good question. Uh, it's always hard to kind of give 
your opinion when you're on the outside. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, yeah, from what I see on the field, it's completely different than what goes on in a locker room and what the coaching staff sees and all that stuff. So I just have to, honestly, I have to believe that every single one of them is doing their job to their fullest ability, as well as the coaching staff and the JFF. And I think over time it'll come. Um, maybe just continuing to work hard and working together. Because, yeah, it's it's always hard to kind of put your input in when you're not physically there and seeing what's going on. And to, and to, to, to wrap it up, bro, um, there's something. Because I, I would have spoken about the girls. Like, I hear Trudy and I hear Jody um, talking. Um, is there ever a language barrier on the pitch between maybe not you, you grew up in a household, but between some of the girls who might have been more removed? From their Jamaican heritage, has is there ever um, any form of issues to communicate with Sashana and Jody and Chuli and so forth? I think no. Pretty much everyone is like, it's quite cultured that they understand it all. all right. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Now we see for this is the end. All good things must come to an end. We're enjoying ourselves. It's, Unfortunately. A, nice, it's, a, it's a really good com um, conversation. But what the <laughs> time? Marla for passing through. Thank you for being on our platform. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure Joe Mar enjoyed this one. Jerry's favorite player. And I'm sure <laughs> everybody everybody would know that you know, Marla said one of my favorite uh, oh. my stream. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, so, yeah, man. We want to talk to some more of the girls, you know, get to know, you know, some more of the Jamaican athletes. And yeah. you're the first of that. Yeah, so. as, as we say in Jamaica, set the link, Marla. Yeah, yeah, set yeah, the link. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are counting on you. To get us the other girls to come and expose them because a lot of people are interested you know the people want to know we can go on wikipedia we can see everything about bobby reed and everything about adrian mariapa right it's mm -hmm. not as available to us with you guys and yeah. as such it's incumbent on us the people of the media you know this are not sports tv to to get you guys out there to show you up because we really we really are behind this female team so Set the link, Marla. We want to talk to Tiffany because she's I right here. My and favorite, bro. We want to talk to Channel Lou Asha. That's <laughs> Russell's favorite. That's you know, favorite. Rebecca Spencer, so on and so forth. So uh -huh. we need you to campaign for us to get some of these interviews going. We're counting on you for that. All, Put right. You the spot. All right. I'm going to give Marla her last say. What do you want to say to the people watching and to the Jamaican supporters? Mm, just thank you. Respect and, you know, keep supporting us. There we go. People. Make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe to the channel. Getting to know our feature is 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 a virtual one. We will be doing some um, in person. Yeah, man. Hopefully one day you can come in the studio and we sit over yeah. and talk for the love, love for the love. Where want people before before we leave, bro? Before I go, people, this is something that I ask and tell the people to do before every video. If each one of our subscribers can get us five subscribers. You know how many subscribers that will get us? Enough, bro. Enough Marlo, enough. before you go, I want to tell the people to like, share, and subscribe to This Area That Sports TV. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and like, share, comment, and subscribe to This and That Sport. You guys there heard it here. All right. Thank you so much, Marlo. Have a nice day. Thank Good you. Good luck in the cup final on, on Wednesday. OK. I'll let you guys know how it goes. <laughs> Take it home. Big up yourself, Marlo. Bye, thank you. Yeah.